You are listening to Bedtime Dreamy Tales. Share and subscribe our channel. Story title, The Golden Key, Part 1. There was a boy who used to sit in the twilight and listen to his great aunt's stories. She told him that if he could reach the place where the end of the rainbow stands, he would find there a golden key. And what is the key for? The boy would ask. What is it the key of? What will it open? That nobody knows? His aunt would reply. He has to find that out. I suppose being gold, the boy once said thoughtfully, that I could get a good deal of money for it if I sold it. Better never find it than sell it, returned his aunt. And the boy went to bed and dreamed about the golden key. Now, all that his great aunt told the boy about the golden key would have been nonsense had it not been that their little house stood on the borders of fairyland. For it is perfectly well known that out of fairyland, nobody ever can find where the rainbow stands. The creature takes such good care of its golden key, always flitting from place to place, lest anyone should find it. But in fairyland, it is quite different. Things that look real in this country look very thin indeed in fairyland, while some of the things that here cannot stand still for a moment will not move there. So it was not in the least absurd of the old lady to tell her nephew such things about the golden key. Did you ever know anybody to find it? He asked one evening. Yes, your father, I believe, found it. And what did he do with it? Can you tell me? He never told me. What was it like? He never showed it to me. How does a new key come there always? I don't know, there it is. Perhaps it is the rainbow's egg. Perhaps it is. You will be a happy boy if you find the nest. Perhaps it comes tumbling down the rainbow from the sky. Perhaps it does. One evening, in summer, he went into his own room and stood at the lattice window and gazed into the forest which fringed the outskirts of Fairyland. It came close up to his great-aunt's garden and, indeed, sent some straggling trees into it. The forest lay to the east, and the sun, which was setting behind the cottage, looked straight into the dark wood with his level red eye. The trees were all old and had few branches below, so that the sun could see a great way into the forest and the boy, being keen-sighted, could see almost as far as the sun. The trunks stood like rows of red columns in the shine of the red sun, and he could see down aisle after aisle in the vanishing distance. And as he gazed into the forest, he began to feel as if the trees were all waiting for him and had something they could not go on with till he came to them. But he was hungry and wanted his supper, so he lingered. Suddenly, far among the trees, as far as the sun could shine, he saw a glorious thing. It was the end of a rainbow, large and brilliant. He could count all seven colours and could see shade after shade beyond the violet, while before the red stood a colour more gorgeous and mysterious still. It was a colour he had never seen before. Only the spring of the rainbow arch was visible. He could see nothing of it above the trees. The golden key he said to himself and darted out of the house and into the wood. He had not gone far before the sun set, but the rainbow only glowed the brighter. For the rainbow of fairyland is not dependent upon the sun as ours is. The trees welcomed him. The bushes made way for him. The rainbow grew larger and brighter, and at length he found himself within two trees of it. It was a grand sight burning away there in silence with its gorgeous, its lovely, its delicate colours, each distinct, all combining. He could now see a great deal more of it. It rose high into the blue heavens, but bent so little that he could not tell how high the crown of the arch must reach. It was still only a small portion of a huge bow. He stood gazing at it till he forgot himself with delight, even forgot the key which he had come to seek. And as he stood, it grew more wonderful still. For in each of the colours, which was as large as the column of a church, he could faintly see beautiful forms slowly ascending as if by the steps of a winding stair. The forms appeared irregularly. Now one, now many, now several, now none. Men and women and children, all different, all beautiful. He drew nearer to the rainbow. It vanished. He started back a step in dismay. It was there again, as beautiful as ever. So he contented himself with standing as near it as he might and watching the forms that ascended the glorious colours towards the unknown height of the arch, 
which did not end abruptly, but faded away in the blue air so gradually that he could not say where it ceased. When the thought of the golden key returned, the boy very wisely proceeded to mark out in his mind the space covered by the foundation of the rainbow in order that he might know where to search should the rainbow disappear. It was based chiefly upon a bed of moss. Meantime, it had grown quite dark in the wood. The rainbow alone was visible by its own light. But the moment the moon rose, the rainbow vanished. Nor could any change of place restore the vision to the boy's eyes. So he threw himself down upon the mossy bed to wait till the sunlight would give him a chance of finding the key. There he fell fast asleep. When he woke in the morning, the sun was looking straight into his eyes. He turned away from it and the same moment saw a brilliant little thing lying on the moss within a foot of his face. It was the golden key. The pipe of it was of plain gold, as bright as gold could be. The handle was curiously wrought and set with sapphires. In a terror of delight, he put out his hand and took it and had it. He lay for a while, turning it over and over and feeding his eyes upon its beauty. Then he jumped to his feet, remembering that the pretty thing was of no use to him yet. Where was the lock to which the key belonged? It must be somewhere, for how could anybody be so silly as make a key for which there was no lock? Where should he go to look for it? He gazed about him, up into the air, down to the earth, but saw no keyhole in the clouds, in the grass, or in the trees. Just as he began to grow disconsolate, however, he saw something glimmering in the wood. It was a mere glimmer that he saw, but he took it for a glimmer of rainbow and went towards it. And now I will go back to the borders of the forest. Not far from the house where the boy had lived, there was another house, the owner of which was a merchant who was much away from home. He had lost his wife some years before and had only one child, a little girl, whom he left to the charge of two servants who were very idle and careless. So she was neglected and left untidy and was sometimes ill-used besides. Now it is well known that the little creatures commonly known as fairies, though there are many different kinds of fairies in fairyland, have an exceeding dislike to untidiness. Indeed, they are quite spiteful to slovenly people. Being used to all the lovely ways of the trees and flowers, and to the neatness of the birds and all woodland creatures, it makes them feel miserable, even in their deep woods and on their grassy carpets, to think that within the same moonlight lies a dirty, uncomfortable, slovenly house. And this makes them angry with the people that live in it, and they would gladly drive them out of the world if they could. They want the whole earth nice and clean. So they pinch the maids black and blue and play them all manner of uncomfortable tricks. But this house was quite a shame, and the fairies in the forest could not endure it. They tried everything on the maids without effect, and at last resolved upon making a clean riddance, beginning with the child. They ought to have known that it was not her fault, but they have little principle and much mischief in them, and they thought that if they got rid of her, the maids would be sure to be turned away. So one evening, the poor little girl having been put to bed early, before the sun was down, the servants went off to the village, locking the door behind them. The child did not know she was alone, and lay contentedly looking out of her window towards the forest, of which, however, she could not see much, because of the ivy and other creeping plants which had straggled across her window. All at once, she saw an ape making faces at her out of the mirror, and the heads carved upon a great old wardrobe, grinning fearfully. Then, two old spider-legged chairs came forward into the middle of the room and began to dance a queer, old-fashioned dance. This set her laughing, and she forgot the ape and the grinning heads. So the fairies saw they had made a mistake, and sent the chairs back to their places. But they knew that she had been reading the story of Silverhair all day. So, the next moment, she heard the voices of the three bears upon the stair. Big voice, middle voice, and little voice and she heard their soft, heavy tread, as if they had stockings over their boots, coming nearer and nearer to the door of her room, till she could bear it no longer. She did just as Silverhair did, and as the fairies wanted her to do. She darted to the window, pulled it open, got upon the ivy, and so scrambled to the ground. She then fled to the forest as fast as she could run. 
Now, although she did not know it, this was the very best way she could have gone, for nothing is ever so mischievous in its own place as it is out of it. And besides, these mischievous creatures were only the children of Fairyland, as it were, and there are many other beings there as well. And if a wanderer gets in among them, the good ones will always help him more than the evil ones will be able to hurt him. If you like this story, please give this video a like. For more stories, go to bedtimedreamytales.com. See you in the next story.